Good evening and a very, very warm welcome. My name is Connie Isink. I'm the president of Great and Small's board. And on behalf of everyone in our organization, thank you so much for joining us for a special conversation with Dr. Temple Grandin and Dr. Deborah Moore. It's a real pleasure to be with you all today. I'd also like to thank our generous sponsors. Their support, as well as donations from so many of you has made this event possible. So our thanks again for being there for us. We truly couldn't do this without you. Before we start, let me just say a few words about our organization. Great and Small is a nonprofit in Maryland. We've been in existence for over 20 years, including somehow keeping our doors open through the recent pandemic. No small task, but somehow we made it. Very briefly, we provide therapeutic riding, fun, empowering activities with our lovely horses for kids and adults with physical, developmental, emotional, and learning challenges, including autism, which affects nearly 70% of the riders who come to us at Great and Small. Hence our very important topic for this evening, the magic of therapeutic riding, a conversation with Temple Grandin and Deborah Moore. Temple Grandin did not speak until she was three and a half years old. She had frequent severe emotional meltdowns and was wrongly diagnosed with brain damage. The medical advice at that time for a child with her symptoms was to be placed in an institution. Fortunately, Temple's mother was absolutely opposed to this and instead she found early speech therapy and other help for her daughter. However, during childhood and especially during adolescence, Temple encountered bullying. And at the end of 14, she was expelled from school for throwing a book at a student who teased her. During this time though, she found comfort in drawing, making things and having a few friends with shared interests. In high school, her enthusiasm for science was fueled under the guidance of a very special teacher. As a teenager with autism, struggling to find her place in the world, Temple attended a school with horses that she could ride and also spent a summer on her aunt's ranch in Arizona, where she was again exposed to horses and also to livestock. That exposure and those experiences changed her life. It has also changed the field of livestock handling and welfare and has given us a strong, outspoken advocate for people with autism. Temple was one of the first people to speak and write about what it's like to be autistic. Her first book, Emergence, labeled autistic, was unprecedented and groundbreaking. She obtained a bachelor's degree in psychology and both master's and doctorate degrees in animal science. And once she began sharing her experiences and her expertise, Temple Grandin never stopped. She works tirelessly to educate others about how to handle livestock and design equipment, as well as autism and how to help autism, autistic children reach their full potential. A professor of animal science at Colorado State University, she has been named one of the top college professors in the country. And in 2021, the new Temple Grandin Equine Center opened its doors as a leading facility, offering therapeutic services to people of all abilities and backgrounds. And if that wasn't enough, HBO made an Emmy award-winning movie about her life. She's been named as one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential people in the world and inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the National Women's Hall of Fame. We are indeed honored to have Temple with us tonight. I'm also delighted to welcome psychologist and autism expert, Dr. Deborah Moore, who is joining Temple in our conversation today. With more than 30 years of work as a psychologist with kids on the autism spectrum and guiding and supporting those who love and care for them, Deborah has much wisdom and experience to share with us. I'd like to quickly mention here two books that Deborah and Temple have collaborated on. The Loving Push, How Parents and Professionals Can Help Spectrum Kids Become Successful Adults, which was published in 2016 and is now in its second edition. And Navigating Autism, Nine Mindsets for Helping Kids on the Spectrum, their second book together, published just last year in 2021. So we have some pretty impressive superstar guests with us today. 
this really is a wonderful opportunity for a little organization like ours to be hosting this conversation and a real priv privilege for us to learn from the best. So my thanks again to Temple and Deborah, and let me turn over to you. Hi. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Moore, and we're going to have a great time this evening. Thank you for joining us. Anytime I get the opportunity to talk to Temple, it's always interesting, and tonight will be no exception. Uh, let's get started. My first question to you, Temple, is you're a very, very busy person. How did we get you to give an hour of your time to us this evening? Well, I think it's just really important to get the message out. Um, I was a teenager, bullied, having a horrible time, worst part of my life. And the horses were kind of my salvation. In fact, I have a paper online that's titled How Horses Help the Teenager with Autism Make Friends and Learn How to Work. Because I did two things with horses. I rode them, and that's where I had friends. I was a terrible student, but Mr. Patey, the head of the school, put me to work managing the horse barn. I had nine stalls to clean every day. I fed them. I put them in and out of the barn. I basically ran the horse barn. So I also learned how to work. Didn't do very much studying to, during that time, but I learned how to work. And I had friends who the shared interest of horses, getting our horses ready to show them. I was very much into junior shows at that time. And so there's two things that horses did, and they were very, very important uh, part of my life. You have a special affinity for horses and, and for animals in general. Well, I'm a visual thinker. I'm a total visual thinker. Everything I think about is a picture. Now, an animal doesn't think in words. Animals going to think in pictures. In fact, I've got a new book coming out in the fall. You pre-order right now. Visual Thinking by Temple Grandin. And I present science that shows that there's different kinds of thinking. I talked about thinking in pictures in one of my previous books. Well, that's more like how an animal thinks. Animals don't think in words. Now, when I was in a teenager and when I was in my 20s, I didn't know that um, other people thought in words. I learned that in my late 30s. That was kind of a shocker. But now science has shown that there's an object visualizer like me, and we're terrible at math. Then there's the mathematical pattern thinker. And then there's the word thinker, of course. And then there's people that are mixtures of the different ways that people think. Do you have any thoughts about how those different kinds of thinkers react in um, equine therapy or how to tailor equine therapy to those kinds of thinkers? Well, visual thinkers tend to love animals. There's like four things that visual thinkers excel at. Art, photography, animals, and car mechanics, mechanical things. Those seem to go together, those uh, four things. You want to get a visual thinker off the video games? Replace them with car mechanics or replace them with working with animals. They're going to find that that's more interesting than video games. Yeah. You, you talk um, in your book, In Animals in Translation, about some specific horses. I remember you mentioned um, Goldie, was it? Goldie, and yeah. You see, our school didn't have much money, so they go buy a pretty horse. That was sound. It didn't have anything wrong with it physically, but there were behavior problems. Uh -huh. Goldie was a horse that had been probably been abused. I didn't know the things that I know now about animals. Now, Goldie, you could work with her on the ground. She was a perfect lady when I held her for shoeing, but get on her back and she would just go berserk. And you see, this is where animal thinking is specific on the ground and nobody hurt me. On the back, someone had hurt me. Right. There's a term, um, fear specificity. Yeah, fears are very specific in animals, like in animals in translation. And by the way, I've got that right here. I'm a shameless book promoter. And, and I, I saw I met a horse that was terrified of black cowboy hats. Mm -hmm. He had been abused by a person wearing a black cowboy hat. This idiot threw alcohol in his face. A white cowboy hat made no reaction, but a black cowboy hat was very scary. Now, if I put the black cat on the ground, it wasn't as scary. I got him to touch it on the ground. But the closer the cat got to my head, like that horse uh, tense right up and it was getting ready to rear. You mm -hmm. see, fear mm -hmm. memories are very specific. Another thing working with horses is you have to teach them about all sides of an object. All right, let's take something like uh, wheelchairs, for example. They need to see that object from all sides. In fact, one of my students, Megan Corgan, did a fascinating experiment that now proved the scientific experiment uh, that um, 
uh, how an object looks. A horse might perceive an object as something different when it's rotated. So little fillies and colts, young horses were walked by a children's play set that had a little slide and a swing 15 times until they no longer reacted. Now you take that play set and you rotate it, it turned into a new object. Now think about it. This is the slide on the play set. You see that looks different. Think it visualizes as a slide on a children's play set. It became a new object. We've got a paper on that too. You can just look up Temple Grandin American Quarter Horse for keywords. Right. I don't know why we had to put American Quarter Horse in the title, but the reviewers wanted that. Yeah. Makes it easy to find the paper. <laughs> So I don't think most neuro, neurotypical people or maybe most people, period, have any clue that when an object is rotated, an animal or an autistic person may not recognize well, that. Well, that's object. right. And you would look at, most people would look at it and go, yeah, that's a kid's toy. Even if you saw it rotated. Right. Now, they, um, she just set the play set in an alcove in the barn and watched the fillies and, and, and walked the fillies and colts by it. Now, if that had been done at a gallop and someone had been riding, they would have been dumped. This experiment was all done in a slow walk. So which is what that shows is you have new things like maybe medical equipment. You've got to get your horses used to it. They're going to need to see all sides of that piece of equipment. It's also really important that an animal's first experience with something new is good. A new person, a new saddle, a new anything. So pretty much every sentence you're saying, I'm substituting the word child or well, that's autistic right. person, and it fits. Well, most a lot of autistic people think in pictures, and um, it's it's sensory based world. You see, to understand an animal, you've got to get away from verbal language. And some of these kids, it's a sensory based world, not a verbal world. Right. And so for you, if an object is rotated, can, can you still see what? Oh, yeah, I would know it's a play set. Yeah, I would. Um, but uh, the horse doesn't know right. what, the horse has no idea what the thing is for. And, and do you think there, there are autistic children, though, who if an object is rotated, it could frighten them because they don't recognize what it is? It's possible it could. But when you look at, think about, just think about, it. now just imagine if this is just a slide, if this stapler is a slide on a play set. Okay, mm -hmm. see how this stapler looks like? Right. Now let's say, let's say it's a 10 foot long stapler. Then I rotate it. Right. It looks totally different. It looks totally different. And it might look a lot scarier. It might, because the shape is completely different. So walk children around. Yeah, objects. you know, walk around stuff. One of the things with autistic kids, no surprises. Surprises right. scare animals and surprises scare autistic kids. No surprises. That's kind of a good rule. Mm -hmm. Also, it's good for kids to have some control on, on the, some limited choice. Mother used to give me limited choice. And OK, we could do this activity. We could play this board game or that board game. Uh, or we could do, I uh, saw you putting some little plastic objects on the horse's mane. Um, well, we can do, I don't know what that's called, put plastic things on the horse's mane, or we can do something with the traffic cone. Because uh, I'm just thinking of some of the things I've seen in therapeutic riding. And, and sometimes give them a choice. You know, do this little activity or that little activity. Well, your mom gave you a big choice. Yeah. Well, okay. actually, when I got sent to the special school, she picked out three schools and she, mm -hmm. and I picked Hampshire School. And I, uh, for three years, I didn't do any studying, but I cleaned a lot of horse stalls. And one of the big problems I'm seeing now is these kids aren't learning how to work. I'm seeing way too much video game addiction. They're not getting jobs with video game companies. I would not criticize it if they were getting jobs with video game companies. But that's not what's happening. But I've now found five cases. This is young adults. This is not children. Young adults, fully verbal, auto mechanics got them off of video games. They found that that was more interesting than the video game. And I think animals is another thing we can use to get kids off of video games. And I'm not that I'm pushing auto mechanics, but I'll have five case histories now where auto mechanics was the thing that worked with right. young, young, fully verbal adults. Well, hands-on activities, we, we always say, are, are gonna be appealing. Well, that's why I did my children's books, like the outdoor scientist, get kids outside, uh, kids don't are, are totally removed from the world of, of hands-on things. I had a student in my class last year who had never used a tape measure or a ruler to measure anything. 
I, 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 about 20, 30 percent of kids in a suburb outside of Denver never make paper airplanes. Hmm. Well, they, they haven't learned, you know, tinkering and just figuring things out. Right. Right. So when you were a kid and your, your mom gave you these choices, so you could go to one of these schools and you could go to your aunt's ranch, I believe it was for like a week or for well, the Well, my mother I wasn't going to have not going was one of the options. That was not an option. It was a week. And if I hated it, I could come home or stay all summer. When I got out there, I loved it. And had and you I talked to a lot of parents, already? Uh, uh, their kids afraid to do stuff. Right. And too many parents overshoulder their kid and and um, I've been to several programs where they get kids doing stuff, surfing, going on boats and zip lines, uh, doing stuff out in the woods, these kind of, you know, programs like this. And I think the biggest thing that those programs do for the kids is show the parent, yeah, my autistic kid actually got on a surfboard or he got on a boat and they can't believe that he actually did it. Because I see too many parents, and this is your term, Deborah, label locking. So locked into the label, they can't imagine their kids even capable of doing anything. Yeah, it's, it's frustrating for us because we believe once kids are exposed to things, potential blossoms that we had no idea was there. You, we would have had, you would not have been the person you are if you hadn't been exposed. The world would not be well, the world. Well, how did I get into the cattle industry and animals? I was exposed as a right. child. Right. And with a lot of career things, it starts with exposure and then later on mentoring. Now, horses are big animals and they can be pretty scary yep. to, to kids. Were they scary to you at the beginning? Or No, you... no, they were not scary. Hmm. I'm, and I worked really hard on my our horse showing. I made a Western parade outfit out of an old harness I found up in the horse barn attic. It wasn't the most beautiful thing. People might have laughed at it but it was a Western Parade breast collar that I had made myself. Well, that was another hands-on activity. You talked also, I think it was in, let me check my notes here. You talked in um, Animals in Translation about one time when you were riding your horse King and you there was a costume show coming up. Oh yeah, I was dressed up as an astronaut. Yeah. And um, King just had a fit. And I finally found out that uh, the problem was a little wire on the space helmet that went. Whoa, 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 whoa. Space helmet? Yeah, space helmet. I was dressed up as an astronaut. This is a costume class. Oh. And I was going as a 2020 stick shift <laughs> horse. And he had, I had, a, I, on the breast collar, I had a, I had a gear shift, walk, trot, and canter. You know, I would shift on a wireless astronaut suit that I had made. And I'm, um, I uh, no problem with these, you know, I had a Serapi with cardboard rockets on it. And he had no problem with that. But there was this little wire that made this really creepy sound. I took the wire off and then he was just fine. That is a fantastic example because somehow out of all those variables that you talked about that we might think King would have not been too fond about dressing up like that. Um, he was a very forgiving horse, wasn't he? Um, but but, but how the did you get scared it was him wasn't the whole astronaut yeah, suit? It, out, though? it was one little wire that had a coiled wire on the like antenna on it that went. So it's a one piece of wire, and he was fine with the whole rest of the outfit. Okay, all right. Let's talk about sensory sensitivity a minute. Let's talk about sound. Okay. Let's start with sound since we're talking about that. Well, loud sounds when I was a kid, it was like a dentist drill um, hitting a nerve in my ear. And there's actually been some practical experience that shows if you let the child initiate the sound, they can tolerate it better. So let the child beep the car horn. Let the child turn on the hairdryer. Let the child turn on whatever the noisy thing is that scares them. Let them control it. Now, the other thing about headphones, if you wear headphones all the time, your hearing will get more sensitive and it'll make it worse. Now it's okay to have them with you. That gives you control. They can always be with you. But try not to wear them, except in a few really horrible noisy places, like maybe these uh, bathrooms where every flushers randomly works different. So you put them on for that horrible, I call it industrial strength bathroom, and then take it off. Well, you've got the surprise and the noise there. That's well, the problem you've got with those flushers is every stall is different. They're not predictable on how they work. So horses aren't always predictable. How does that work with equine therapy? 
Well, you see, one of the reasons why I did this experiment on the rotated playset is I wanted to explain this problem of people say, well, the horse just spooked. Mm -hmm. Well, he didn't just spook. Mm -hmm. There was a reason. Something was rotated. Some little thing, or uh, there was something out there that the horse, you know, paid attention to. Right. And people say the kid just had a meltdown. Well, there's a reason. Okay, let's start looking. I get I get asked about meltdowns all the time. The first thing I ask is, did it happen in a really noisy environment where there was a lot of noise? Did it happen when the child was tired? Mother noticed that I got a lot worse when I got tired. Um, was a meltdown happening because frustration to communicate? It was hugely frustrating not being able to communicate. Another thing on kids that are verbal, they're like a phone with slow service. You've got to give them time to respond. They're like a phone with one bar of service. And it takes it time to download the web page, that being the language. And you've got to give them time to respond. And if you go in their face too much, they'll freeze. Just and like you, if I you click can't on have computer, other programs going in the background. Well, yeah, that's right. Now, if I click on the computer too many times, it doesn't open quickly. I got to click once and wait for it to open. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How about let's talk about some of the other sensory issues. Okay. Uh, vision, vision sensory, I don't have, but I'm learning more about problems now with LED lighting. It mm -hmm. used to be that fluorescent lights were the terrible kind of light that flicker. They didn't bother me, but they bother some people. And some LEDs flicker. The, the cheap ones you, that are like a light bulb you screw in, they usually flicker. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you how to find out which LEDs flicker. Get a real high-end phone that can take slow motion video. Film the room in slow motion. Huh. Play it back in slow motion. Then you need to have somebody waving so you're sure it's playing back in slow motion. And um, well, I did this one time at a, a really nice church that had a really great autism program. Fortunately, their expensive ceiling lights did not flicker. The exit sign did. And then over at a school, the things you screw in flickered. I don't have a good enough phone for, for that. Um, to test that, but I had a lighting contractor come up to me at book stand and showed me how to do that. Oh, wow, that's great. You know, and this is something simple um, that um, uh, in their sensory room, they had some of the, this other place we went to, they had screw in LEDs and they flickered. And and um, I think it's actually causing some problems with livestock because usually you put a light on a shoot and yeah, well, livestock go right in and and uh, we put a big fat LED light on the shoot just recently, and it did not work. Yeah. I think the cattle are seeing a flicker. Let me let me change topics just because I'm going to go with my loose association here because you you said the word shoot. Um, one of the things we always tell parents and therapists too is to try to understand the world from the autistic child's perspective. And I remember when you were designing the cattle shoot you realized you had to do that. You had to understand the world as much as you could from the cows. have to get, back. cattle are afraid of, cattle get really afraid of a whole lot of visual things. And of course I've done work with the meat plants and they, you know, they know they're gonna, what's gonna happen to the meat plant? No, they're not. I'll tell you what they're afraid of. There's the spider monster. That is a shadow. Is that a big meat plant? Now at 10 o'clock in the morning, the spider monster wasn't there. And uh -huh. this system worked perfectly. And then in the late afternoon, the spider monster appeared and these Angus cattle decided they were not gonna walk over this. I Google earthed the plant recently. They've now built a roof over it because that's the only way they could get rid of the spider monster. Wow. But that is something that uh, they, these cattle were afraid of. That. Sure. And, and it makes and, perfect and logical I, sense once we when understand I it. First started working on cattle handling. The first thing I did is to get down in the shoots and look what cattle were looking at. And I didn't know I was a visual thinker. And people thought that was weird that I would look, I would get in a shoot to see what cattle were looking at. But as a visual thinker, it seemed obvious to me. Yeah, yeah. So is there a way that parents can better understand their child's perspective? I, they can't put themselves inside their child's body. There's well, one of the things that a lot of people have hard time understanding is sensory. And the problem is sensory is extremely variable. Then you've got touch sensitivity problems. And I use my squeezing machine that desensitized me to touch because I could control the squeeze machine. Right. This gets back to this whole element of control on helping a child to get over problems. All right, clothing. 
Let's take the kid shopping and give them some choices. I just bought a new pair of black pants at Walmart that don't itch. Yeah. Um, just the right amount of stretchiness in them. Uh, but I've, I bought some pants at another store and they itched and I had to get rid of them. I can't wear clothes that itch. That's something I still have some problems. Right. And I've actually had really good luck with Walmart. And I bought some stuff in some more expensive stores that itched and I just had to give them away. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems like equine therapy hits all of those senses and gives a kid an opportunity to desensitize because they're touching the horse. Well, that's they're right. Because yeah. you're getting balancing mm -hmm. and rhythm at the same time. And OTs have known for a long time that's really good. Plus, it's a really great activity. You've got relationship with the horse. But you also have balancing and rhythm at the same time. And there is quite a bit of evidence based. In fact, here at our equine center here, Colorado, uh, Colorado State uh, University, uh, Katie Peters has been doing research. She's just gotten some papers published um, showing the efficacy of therapeutic riding. And therapeutic riding had more efficacy than an activity where they worked in a garden. Now the garden activity did have some value, okay. but, but, they, but it, was, it was better than a control but the therapeutic writing was better than the garden activity. Okay. And, well, and I think I, therapeutic writing would, would help, like, like I said, all the senses, but it would also help. You said in animals in translation that horses are like dogs. They try to please. Yeah. People. And that seems to be an important ingredient to me in well, building a relationship with an well, animal. Well, that's right. And the other thing I'm seeing is there's a tendency to help too much. Obviously, there's some individuals who always have to have sidewalkers, always. But then there's others that need to learn to ride independently. Mm -hmm. And again, there's a tendency to overcompensate. Then one time I was out at Therapy Riding Center and you get these kids that are nonverbal and everyone's saying, good job, good job every five seconds. And I found that I had to fight the urge to say that because it messed up the flow of an activity. Uh, and and there was this little three-year-old, I don't know what her diagnosis, little three-year-old that couldn't talk on a horse. They wanted her to toss her something at a traffic cone. She got mad and just heaved the ball. And I just talked to her normally. I said, well, you chucked it. I can't get it. So then I turn around and I faced her son. I'm going to throw this ball to you. And then you're going to throw it back. And I didn't say any good job. Then she threw it back and then I just smiled. And I, uh, because I think sometimes we're saying good job so much, it actually breaks up the rhythm of the activity. Right. In the video um, at the beginning, they showed a little girl, um, it talked about a little girl who was working with a horse named Madonna, who, and the little girl was completely nonverbal. Okay, yeah, and she said, they started saying the worst words, and I've, and I've had other parents say that, I probably have six or seven different parents have said their kid did their first words on a horse, and I think something real is, is happening there. You see rhythm and balancing at the same time. I think also is doing something really good to the nervous system. We don't really know how it works. I'd rather um, um, don't oversell the case. I just say, well, this is what we found. Because you can get off on a lot of wild theory that it turns out later not to be true. Uh, I wanted to hear what your theory was about that. Well, OTs know, do a lot of things with rhythm and balance that stimulates the vestibular system, that does good things in the nervous system. And when you ride a horse, you have to balance and there's rhythm. Okay. And because kids have also talked when they've been doing things like swinging, and the therapist was swinging them, and you stimulate the vestibular system, and it um, it, it does things in the brain. I, I'd rather not oh, speculate on. past the actual knowledge that's known, but clinically okay. it works. Do we and, know? Can I ask you this, Temple? And you can say, you don't want to talk about it anymore, but do we know the connections between the vestibular system and the language output system? I don't think it's well known. Okay. Uh, someone has a paper on that. I certainly like to read it. Yeah. And I'd like to read something. It's not just pure conjecture. In right. fact, actually, I did uh, my um, PhD was in neuroscience. So I took a, a three neuroscience classes. And I think sometimes you can get off into theory that turns into sure. BS that actually hurts your case. It's better just say, like on Katie Peters' study, okay, we had the horse group, we had a garden activity group, and we had a control that was a weightless control. Now, the garden activity was not useless. It did have value, but it wasn't as good as the horses. 
Right. Well, I was reading a study, I think it was just yesterday morning in the New York Times, uh, comparing some, there were boys, I think, elementary age boys, elementary school age, and um, some of them spent two, I believe, 30 minute sessions per week with dogs. And the other group did two 30 minute sessions per week of relaxation therapy. And the relaxation therapy was useful, but not <laughs> as useful as the um, time with the dogs. And what their measurement was, was the stress level measured by uh, cortisol in the boy's saliva. Okay, well, that, that's an objective measure. Right, yeah. right. And, and um, you know, and Katie Peters' research is showing that uh, uh, therapeutic riding worked better than a garden activity, which yeah. was a decent activity. Right, right. It's more powerful. I was also reading a study that um, to speak, to go back to the idea that some parents are afraid to let their children try something new. Um, and I'm sure that comes up around equine therapy that the child says, ah, I'm scared of oh, that. Oh, here's a paper I'm going to have to read. Well, a brand new paper on vestibular and language 2020. Oh. That's a new paper. You found it. Okay. Um, and you know what uh, I'm going to do before that disappears. I got I got a screen sequence right now. I know I'm I, I, really obnoxious, but no, it's I'm okay because because Campbell, I want to get that paper before that disappears. I understand you can't remember things because, like, you just interrupted me. I can't. One well, of the things I can't remember. I can't remember. <laughs> okay, I got it. It I screenshot it right here. Okay, good. Okay, they what, they um. What was I, I saying? I whoa, 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 they, whoa, 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 whoa! What was I saying? A second. Wait a you minute. You were saying. See, oh. I have problems with remembering long strings of verbal information. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about some other tips to help minds that are different out in the workplace. I cannot remember long strings of verbal information, and that's where any task involving sequence, I need a pilot's checklist. Step one, step two, step three. Okay, let's say how to unjam the copy. Step one, step two, step three, maybe tacking up hours. Pilot's checklist. Also, I cannot multitask. I basically have no working memory. Now, in my professional life, writing and designing equipment, I don't need working memory. Hmm. I don't need working memory for that. Well, what I was going to say was that I read a study that said that kids' uh, cortisol level when they started equine therapy. Uh, went down except for the first session it went up which makes perfect well, sense that makes the first situation. session it went up because it was novel exactly and, and i want to just say to parents of course your kid's going to get more stressed at the very beginning and that's yes, that's right that's 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 part of the deal you well, and you that's push absolutely past right it. you know when i got stressed about you know going out to my aunt's ranch and yeah. then once i got out there i really liked it you know, you have to stretch these kids. I like this term stretching. And we talked about that, that in our other book, The Loving Push. Uh, give choices, but stretch. But I'm seeing way too many kids in a way too much of a disability mentality. The amount of teenagers I have seen fully verbal that have never gone shopping is absolutely ridiculous. Things I was doing at seven and eight, uh, they don't, they haven't ever done. Right, right, right. Well, equine therapy is good because not only do they get the, the uh, vestibular stimulation and the sensory desensitization, but they learn mastery. They learn a sense of, because it's not like you get, I think some people who don't know, just picture a kid riding a horse, but it's so much more than that. You help take care of the horse. You get the horse ready for riding. You put things away at the end. You learn to follow directions and get hands-on experience. Well, and I, you know, for three years, I basically ran a horse farm. I did not buy the feet. I didn't do the financials, mm -hmm. but I did everything except the financials. And I would assume that that really changed your self-confidence. But it's taught work skills and that and those are different skills than academic skills right, right. and let's talk about work skills let's uh, let's encourage some of these kids that you know that do things like you know help clean stalls uh tacking horses up uh, putting stuff away that's part of learning the work skills right right let's see some of the other things that i was going to ask you um you've said that animals think and not everybody probably. Well, this to... gets back to verbal thinking versus picture thinking. Exactly. Now, some people are very, very highly, highly verbal. In fact, when I'm working on this book that we're just, I just got a goal with the index tonight. I think they did a really good job on it. And Betsy is very highly verbal, my co-author. Mm 
-hmm. So I'd write the initial drafts and then Betsy would organize everything. And as I worked with Betsy, I learned how different the way she thinks is, but then we recognized how we can work together. She would never be able to talk source material that I came up with, but she organized it. And then she also looked up some stuff that added a lot to the book. Right. So it makes a good team. That's right. You see, that's that that's my my whole thing on complementary skills. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Complementary skills. So when you get, I, I think one of the best situations is when you get kids who have shared interests but complementary skills. Well, I have to think of specific examples. See, I don't think in abstract top down. Right. I think specific examples. When I was talking about the video games, I have five examples where car mechanics was the thing that worked to get young adults off of um, video games. Mm -hmm. you know, they were playing them for like you know, 10 hours a day. Um, but everything I think about, it's a, it's a specific example of how to do something rather than a, you know, a basic principle. Right. And I think most therapists are verbal thinkers. This is the thing. Most therapists are very top down verbal thinkers. And one of the things I got to check the index for, and I'm going to write it down right here, is I got to make sure top down thinking and bottom up thinking is in that index. Sure. Um, because those bottom up thinking concepts are formed with specific examples. Top down, okay, an inclusive classroom. Absolutely no idea how to implement it. Right. You see where my mind works the opposite way. All right, I want to start looking at where inclusive classroom really worked, where it failed. And then I'd want to find a whole bunch of specific examples of successes and maybe failures. And then I can, then I figure out what common factors did the successes have and what common factors did the failures have. Yeah, everything's specific. Everything I, is specific, but yeah. then you, I can categorize information. And I, you know, when I got five examples from five different conferences on the auto mechanics getting kids off of video games, mm -hmm. I'm going to push auto mechanics. Mm -hmm. um, I just, and, I, and, and I asked this one kid, why? And he said, it's just more interesting than video games. Pretty basic. But, the, but that kid would never have known if, if the parent- but Unless someone exposed them to exactly, automatic. Exactly. And, and these kids are not getting wonderful jobs in the video game industry. They're ending up on a disability check. And we need people to fix cars. And one of them is uh, fixing trains and another one is building custom cars. I love it. And you know, something um, like being interested in trains or being interested in horses, whatever. Yeah. It's got so many ways that you can take that interest and spread it out. You exactly. Know? Um, I, I had friends, my roommate in, at the, my special school, Carol, and I would work on getting our horses ready, like for English equitation. You know, we, we were still young enough to be doing youth shows. We had those briar plastic horses and we would make, um, oh, we'd make tack. I would get black shoelaces and I get little pieces of tinfoil. We used to take them off the of cigarette packages. <laughs> little tiny pieces of tinfoil and glue them on the uh, on the on the shoelaces to make western parade tack for our briar horses and that was another activity that we did right you were involved with the theater group no that was when i was in college i got bullied and what helped me to not get bullied we had kind of a variety show and i made scenery for the show and i sung silly songs Again, that is shared, shared interest. Interests. Yeah. This is where you're going to have friends. You see the kind of chit chat talk where I see people chit chatting back and forth and they're just loving it and kind of no, no content, loving this chit chat talk. I can't do it. I can't follow it. I don't have the processing speed to follow that. It goes back and forth so quick. It's like stand up comedians. They go, it goes by too quick. Yeah. And sometimes I think for, for us folks who are verbal, when a child doesn't respond, we, we make it worse because we go faster. No, no, you have to slow down. I know, but we make it worse because- This is the problem. And yeah. give them time to respond and don't get in their face and do that. Because it's like clicking on this mouse 10 times, this computer's gonna take 10 minutes to open up. Right. Because you know what I just told it to do? I told it to open 10 windows all at once. And it doesn't like that. Yep. Yeah. 
I'm looking at <clears throat> my my notes and I'm seeing that you wrote that the the single worst thing you can do to an animal emotionally is to make it feel afraid. Oh well, especially where it's just trapped. That would um that would be um be the worst. It seems like that's this would be the same with kids. Yeah, and autistic kids get scared easily. Autistic kids have an aroused nervous system, they get scared easily. Now I've been on antidepressant medication for uh, 30 over 40 years and I discuss this in my book um, thinking in pictures and antidepressant medication saved me I was being torn apart with colitis I still take an ancient old uh, antidepressant called disipramine I'm now on my third generic vendor I actually google earth one of the plants and I communed with it and I've said please don't break because I really need this medication it saved me and I was in my early 30s. And as I went through my 20s, my anxiety just got worse and worse and worse. And yeah. I did a special brain scan and I found out my amygdala was three times larger than normal. So I was on fear craziness. And I'm, I don't, I've been on it 40 years. I, don't, I wouldn't dare stop taking it. I make sure and I travel in both bags. And when I went to Europe on my first foreign trip, I had a month's supply of the drug. Yeah, yeah. I want and, to and I would sure guess if that, I got stuck there, I wouldn't run out. I would guess that your anxiety started going way up during puberty too, as hormones. Oh, it did. Yeah. My anxiety. I was not anxious as a young child, but puberty, when the estrogen hit, yeah. I was absolute panic monster, and it was just awful. And a lot of this is what they call endogenous anxiety. Mr. Carlock taught me how to look up things in scientific journal articles. And I found this paper on endogenous anxiety and it described my symptoms. And this is back in the late 70s. And I resisted the idea of taking a medication. Did you? Mm. Oh, yeah. And then I had to have a very scary eye surgery um, that because I had a basal cell carcinoma on my eyelid. How mm. about plastic surgery on the eye while you're conscious and there's knives coming down at it? That's not fun. I um, went there, did that. That stressed me out. And then I went on the medication. Mm -hmm. It was like magic. I got a chapter in here called a believer in biochemistry. And I'm not saying uh, everyone should be on meds. One thing, way too many little kids are given meds. It's disgusting. Right. Absolutely disgusting. It's, it's it both goes, directions. There's too many oh, kids on meds, but there's also kids who should be on meds. Well, and uh, meds, uh, one little med yeah. saved me. Yeah, small. I don't dose. think I could have gotten a PhD without it. I would have done the dip fat projects, what mm -hmm. was shown in the movie, because I was not on the meds at that point. Mm -hmm. But my health was absolutely deteriorating. Mm. And, and exercise too. Exercise. I do a burst of hard exercise every night, hundreds of sit-ups every night. I despise every single one of them. And I find that doing that burst of hard exercise does something for me that just walking doesn't. So I added up all the airport walking. Uh -huh. uh, that doesn't really do it. Okay, so I don't take the shuttle and walk out the economy parking lot. That doesn't do the same thing as this burst of hard exercise. And I had to work up to that. It took me three months to work up with that. Yeah, don't give yourself a heart attack. Right. Spend some time working up to it. Right. Okay, let me see what else. Um... You know, as much as you like horses, do you get out and ride? Well, I um, no, I haven't been. I'm kind of worried about falling. My balance is just oh. terrible. Mm. I I had to have uh, have Cheryl's son come in and change light bulbs in the high fixtures. Uh, my cerebellum is twenty percent smaller, and if I stand on a chair and fall, I I might be done for. You know, so. Is, is that That's something I'm really kind of, I'm really careful. I hold the handrail everywhere I go. People I'm say, well, glad how do you get so much energy? Well, I'm, but I've gone down the stairs. I hold the handrail now. Yeah, I'm glad you do. Yep. Is that something that is um, more frequent with autism, that the cerebellum is smaller? Uh, sometimes, but it's not, it's not um, uh, something just all the time. And i uh, but I'm getting out doing my public speaking right now. I had a chance to go riding and I did it at our riding center. They took two of our Western horses, totally freaked them out with drones. And then we were supposed to ride them. Oh, no. uh, this was not smart. This is what a news crew did. 
that took those horses 20 minutes to calm down. So if a horse gets really frightened, it takes 20 minutes to calm down. Mm -hmm. I mean, the same thing with a kid. Right. If you've ever had a near miss of a car accident, it takes you 20 minutes to calm down. Same thing with an animal if it gets upset. Mm -hmm. And it may take longer for an autistic child. Yeah, because for one thing, minutes. their system is up higher to begin with. That's right. So we talk about that in navigating autism, that to have a child in an academic setting, most of the time their system is up too high That's right. really to be able to take information in. Well, and the this first is what thing happened with me. I would be getting, I did be getting a panic attack over just dumbest little things that wouldn't bother most people. Right, right. Do you use relaxation therapy yourself? Well, I was uh, using my squeezy machine. Actually, now I do the virtual squeeze machine. I just imagine that now in my head. Oh, wow. Virtual squeeze machine. That's wonderful. Yeah, I do do that sometimes. Like when I'm just like fidgeting on a plane, you know, wiggling my foot around. Okay, okay, virtual squeeze machine. Do you ever just take your own hands and, and do it? No, I just visualize. And I can feel it when I visualize it. How long have you been doing that? Ever since the squeeze machine broke and I didn't get around to fixing it. <laughs> that was about 10 years ago. As I recall, the, the squeeze machine is upstairs as kind of serving as a clothes hanger. Yes, it's got lot, it's got pairs of pants on it that itched yeah. and I don't know, I'm probably gonna give them away. <laughs> Oh, well, we've got only about 10 minutes left. So let's see if there's anything we forgot to talk about that we think is important. Well, I want to just look at the very first question that came in. I want to really thank the young man who's on the spectrum was in college. And he said that I inspired him. That's made my day. And he says, I've not given up. And I want to say that Kayla, oh, excuse me, Kayla, it's a lady. Um, and work hard. And there'll be times where things will get tough, but work hard, find mentors, find people that can help you. Uh, that's really important. But you know, you can do it. That's good advice. And I, I would say, you know, to parents, a similar um, sentiment of find support for yourself. Uh, I had to become an award-winning professor and was a really terrible student. The last year, I knuckled down and studied. And I knuckled down and I studied when studying became a pathway to becoming a scientist. Now there was a reason to study. Go. Yeah. There was now a reason to study. Algebra, I still can't do. Us visual thinkers can't do algebra. And I'm very concerned about us being screened out of all kinds of programs right now. They got five times more math requirements for just about every field. Mm. And you need our, our visual thinkers. And when in my new book on uh, visual thinking, we need visual thinkers to prevent messes like Fukushima. Yeah. Watertight doors would have saved it. The problem is the engineers didn't see the electrically operated emergency cooling pump drowning, and it's not going to run. And when you need that pump, you really need it. I don't can't design a reactor, but you see how simple that, that is. Thing. Somebody didn't say you have to put watertight doors on this thing. It would not have happened if they'd had them. That's why you need people like me who can't do algebra. What I've learned is mathematicians calculate risk. I see it. I have a feeling our supply chain problems might not be the well, same. Well, this is some, right? I just heard the baby formula factory. They got back online. Now it's flooded. Oh. This is, uh, I've, yeah, this is a real supply chain. Biggest fragile, biggest fragile. And yeah, there's baby formula fragile. messes. And now the factory's flooded. And it's going to take another month to clean it up. It depends how badly it was flooded. I'm going, you've got to be kidding. Biggest fragile. Temple, it is always a delight to talk to you. You you have such a huge perspective, and yet you see every little detail. Well, the thing I had to learn is which details were important. Hmm. In food safety, we have a concept called HACCP, Hazard Analysis Critical Control Points. And when we first had to implement that after a big food poisoning mess in the early 90s, hmm. you can't measure everything in a factory. 
Mm -hmm. You have to figure out what points in the process are the critical control points where you can really likely to get something contaminated. I love that concept because you have to pay attention to details, but you have to pick out the details that are really important, not the ones that are not important. Well, excellent advice. Okay, now the thing is, uh, the test was asking about a son works hard, succeeds, but totally forgets that feeling. How can I help him hang on to his accomplishments, mm -hmm. be inspired for the next challenge? I think the thing to do is you've got to not take your eyes off the goal. There's always a goal. And when I was in, in graduate school, somebody scrawled on the wall of the art building. Obstacles are those terrible things you see when you take your eyes off the goal. Mm -hmm. And now within this world of Google, I found out Henry Ford wrote that. But of course, I didn't know that in the 70s. But you've got to keep your eyes on some kind of a higher goal to keep you going. Can I ask what your goals are at this point? At this point, I'll be 75 this summer and I won't have to take my shoes off at the airport ever again. <laughs> and um, I think my purpose now at this age, more than working out in the field so much in the cattle industry, though they need me. Oh, I got a call last night, screwed up little plant, everything done wrong in it. Oh, they didn't put in a nonsense flooring. I think my main thing for me to be doing now is inspiring students because they're the next generation that I got to do things. And if I can inspire students to go out and do things, constructive things, okay, you're running a therapeutic writing center, that's something That's something constructive. And the other thing is people asked me how why I was effective in the cattle industry. I picked out something relatively targeted, cattle mm -hmm. handling. That's not the whole world. Hmm. You pick out something, okay, you run a good therapeutic writing center that does good things. I'd also recommend that you write about them because I wrote about my projects. Yeah. And you'll have more effect if you write just how to instructions on how to do stuff. Don't hang on to your IP, turn it loose. All right. IP is intellectual property. Turn it loose. Too many people hang on to it too much. Because I've, uh, and I was a good writer. I was a terrible student. But by ninth grade, I was a good writer because my teacher marked up my work and made me write book reports. Yeah. And I was a, and in ninth grade, I had better writing than a lot of college students do today. Yeah. The and other thing was I, I, I would say that you don't have is you don't have a lot of ego or you don't have any ego. And I have, that, I have project loyalty. Yes. It's a project done. I just call it project loyalty. The military or the astronauts call it the mission. No, the ego, oh, you get some guy, a verbal guy out of sales, put him in charge of a construction project. You won't have a factory closed because it didn't have enough wastewater treatment. Even after he was told it didn't have enough wastewater treatment and it was closed, $20 million screw up. Big ego, sales, big yacker, wouldn't listen to anybody. No, that's not being project loyal. I don't know, how could you do that? No, let's, I, what I want to try to do constructive things in the real world. It makes me really happy when a parent comes to me and so my kid's got a job or my kid went and bought a house or some other thing. Then I'm doing my job. Well, you've done That's it well. That's what I figure I got to do now. Right. We appreciate it. You give it back to us all the time. Um, and I know you're going to keep doing it. I'm sure Great and Small is very grateful for you being here tonight and well, I hope I you know feel free to post this video whatever you want to do with it because I want to see the kids that are different get out and be successful get out and have a life they like because one of the things that gave me meaning is having an interesting career and you always have to keep talking about basics even in cattle handling non-stop flooring I uh, still have to keep talking about those basics well, that's okay. Well, let's say good night and thank you to Great and Small for giving us this opportunity. Thank you, Temple, for sharing so much wisdom and inspiration and motivation. We appreciate it. Well, and we'll turn it back, I think, to, to Great and Small at this point and see if Connie wants to say any words in closing. I do actually, and I'm, I'm fasc fascinated by that conversation. And I don't know what kind of thinker I am because here are my notes as you were talking. 
So somehow I've got to make some sense out of that. Um, thank you so much. Such a rich, engaging conversation, so much to digest and think about. Um, not least for showing us the power of resilience and pushing through, not giving up, but also that there really is magic in therapeutic riding. Well, yes, and it's something that can really help a lot of individuals. And, and uh, also they can learn some work skills there too. There were many yeah, things- Very, very I good heard. at cleaning stalls, <laughs> very good. <laughs> many, many of the reflections that I heard from this conversation that was so interesting, how different people think, people think top down or bottom up. I love the image of Temple, of you as an astronaut. I thought that was fabulous. Um, also paying attention to sensory contexts, touch, sound, light, et cetera, the spider monster. Such a great example. Well, um, it, it, it really messed up the handling system. It worked <laughs> fine at 10 o'clock in the morning and at 2.30, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the spider monster appeared. Well, they filled a roof over the spider monster to get rid of it. <laughs> because they Google Earth it the other day and there's a roof over that part of the handling facility. Fascinating. There was a wonderful quote that you used that I think we all need to um, remember. You said, horses were my salvation. And we see that at Great and Small. They were. We see that time and time again. When I was a troubled teenager, horses were my salvation. And that's why I did the paper. You can look up online now. Horses help the teenager with autism make friends and learn how to work. That's a free access paper that's online. And I, I just want to see the kids that are different get out and do things. And when I was out working in construction all the time, I worked with a lot of skilled tradespeople that were either autistic, dyslexic, or ADHD. You know what? They're not being replaced. We can't find decent welders and electricians right now. They're playing video games in the basement. There's a connection. And it's us visual thinkers. We're the, we're the ones that can't do the math. The mathematicians are all running Silicon Valley. So I think we're at the end of our, we've got a minute to go. I just want to thank everybody here. I want to thank our sponsors again uh, for their generosity and for all of you who donated for this uh, to this event tonight. It was truly, truly an honor to be here. Um, I think there was something like 250 people who registered for this event, which is fabulous. Yep, there's our sponsors. So thank you again. Thank you so much for, for doing this. You, you made this possible. If you've been inspired by this conversation, which I certainly have, there are lots of ways to get involved. If you're local, if you live in Maryland or around the DC area, come and visit Great and Small. There are lots of opportunities to get involved and to help, to volunteer, to sponsor a horse, just to spread the word for Great and Small. And if you're tuning in from across the country, there are lots and lots of their local therapeutic riding centers, and I'm sure that they would love your help and your support. So again, on behalf of Great and Small, Truly, thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you so much, Temple. Thank you so much, Deborah. Um, we really couldn't, couldn't do this without you. Thank you. Well, it was great to be here. Thank you. <laughs>